can to the book of Luke. I'll give you a moment. Verse 24, um, excuse me, chapter 24, and we will read verse 13 through 15. And behold, that very day, two of the disciples were going to a village called Emmaus, which is about seven miles from Jerusalem. And they were talking with each other about all these things that had occurred. And while they were conversing and discussing together, Jesus himself caught up with them and was already accompanying them. Father, I thank you for the blessing on your word this great resurrection day. I ask, O oh God, that the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart will be acceptable in your sight. And so therefore, Lord, when I open my mouth to minister your word, you will fill it. And Father, I give you the praise and I give you the glory. And all of God's people say, amen. amen and amen. Please be seated. Thank you, Lord. I will continue reading. But their eyes were held, or in other words, they were blinded to, whom he, to who he was, so that they could not recognize him. And he said to them, what is this discussion that you are exchanging, throwing back and forth between yourselves as you walk along? And they stood still, looking sad and downcast. Then one of them, named Cleopas, answered him, saying, do you alone dwell as a stranger in Jerusalem, and you do not know the things that have occurred there in these days? And he said to them, what kind of things? And they said to him, about Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet, mighty in work and word before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and rulers gave him up to be sentenced to death, and they crucified him. But we were hoping that it was he who would redeem and set Israel free. Yes, and besides all this, it is now the third day since these things occurred. And moreover, some women of our company astounded us and drove us out of our senses. They were at the tomb early in the morning. In other words, they drove them crazy. Women are still driving men crazy, hallelujah. But did not find his body. And they returned saying that they had even seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. So some of those who were with us went to the tomb, and they found it just as the women had said, but him they did not see. And Jesus said to them, O oh, foolish ones, sluggish in mind, dull of perception, and slow of heart to believe, adhere to and trust and rely on everything that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary and essentially fitting that the Christ, the Messiah, should suffer all these things before entering into his glory, his majesty and splendor? And then beginning with Moses and throughout the prophets, he went on explaining and interpreting to them all the scriptures, the things concerning and referring to himself. But you see, before I go any further, you must understand, beloved, that they still did not know this was Jesus. Then they drew near to the village to which they were going, and he acted as if he would go further. But they urged and insisted, saying to him, Remain with us, for it is towards evening, and the day is now far spent. So he went in to stay with them, and it occurred that he, as he reclined at table with them, he took a loaf of bread, praised God, gave thanks, asked a blessing, and then broke it and was given it to them. Then their eyes were instantly opened. And they clearly recognized him, and he vanished, departed invisibly. And they said to one another, Were not our hearts greatly moved and burned within us while he was talking us on the road to Emmaus? And as he opened, the, as he opened and explained to us the, the sense of the scriptures, and rising up on that very hour, they went back to Jerusalem, where they found the 11 apostles gathered together and those who were with them, who said, the Lord really has risen and has appeared to Simon Peter. In verse 35, and they themselves related in full what had happened on the road and how he was known and recognized by, the, by them in the breaking of bread. This Easter Sunday, the title of my message is simply, he will never leave you. That, beloved, is what Easter, as we call Resurrection Sunday, is all about. 
It's about the death, the burial, the resurrection of Jesus Christ, but it doesn't end there. It's our resurrection. It's what's going to happen to us when our spirit man leaves these bodies that we live in. We will never taste of death because of what he done. Oh, we, we may cease to breathe in this earth, but death will never have a hold of us because we have eternal life because of the one that gave us eternal life. I've often asked this question and I'll ask it to you. Have you ever walked through a cemetery and wondered who was buried there? I remember growing up as a child, my dad every Easter and different times of the year would take us to the, the cemetery in Air, Scotland. And of course, in Scotland, in the British Isles, there's, there's uh, tombstones there that many, 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 many years old, old, old tombstones with all kinds of things written on them. But as a child, I remember walking through the cemetery with my dad and I would read so many of those things on the tombstones. And so many people had so many lovely things to write about their loved ones. But have you ever wondered when you go to the cemetery, who was buried there? Who would it be? Would it be a father, a mother, a brother, a sister, a husband, a child? And the list goes on. But have you ever noticed, beloved, that at a cemetery at this time of the year, many people are there that don't go at any other time. Why? Because they're there to tend the graves of their loved ones. They're there to remember their loved ones. That's one of the things that Jesus put in us was the memory. He said, do this in remembrance of me. Uh, put me in remembrance of my word. And so when we go to the cemeteries and when we look down at that casket, not the casket, but the, the gravestone, and we understand who is behind beneath that sod. We remember the good times. We remember all of this because Easter is coming and we want the grave of our loved one to be well kept. Lots of people will visit that cemetery during Holy Week that they wouldn't do at any other time. There is no better way to understand what this day, beloved, is all about. Visit a cemetery and ponder how great the miracle was over 2,000 years ago, a man defeated death once and for all. He came out of the grave never to die again. God reversed the natural process when he raised his son Jesus from the dead. It is the purest of the purest of purest miracles and a mystery beyond all human knowledge. It, we can't fathom it. Hallelujah. That it happened, we have no doubt, but we cannot explain it. And we cannot repeat it. To come back from the dead, that's the greatest miracle of all. But do you understand today, if you have received Jesus Christ as your Lord and your Savior, you came back from the dead because the Bible says you were dead in your sins and your trespasses. But when he came inside of you, you became alive again. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Oh, I love that old song we sang, alive, alive, alive forevermore. My Jesus is alive, and because he lives, I can face tomorrow. I'm alive because he's alive. So spiritually speaking, we have had that resurrection miracle, and that's why we're still talking about this, this great, awesome resurrection day near, oh, over 20 centuries later. Beloved, the longest walk you'll ever take is to walk away from the grave of someone that you love. And if you've never done it, you can't imagine how difficult it is. To walk away and feel as if the world has came to an end. To walk away and think about what used to be and what might have been, what might be of what could have been. To walk away and realize I'll never be the same again to play over and over in your mind the good times, the laughter, the crazy stories, to reach out and touch a face and find that face is gone forever, to cry until you can't cry anymore, to watch them bury your dreams and hopes, all that was good about life, to know that it's over, done, finished, the end, 
and there is nothing you can do about it. To walk away to friends, although kind and loving friends, they cannot understand, and to a world, for the most part, barely cares. But the scripture says, he will never leave you. You may think you're alone because, beloved, it is the longest walk and the saddest day. Every step takes you away from the tombstone of a broken dream. But for the Christian, hear me, for the Christian, it's not over. Our loved ones have left the land of death and entered the land of the living. And we, the Bible says, that remain still have a work to do. We still have a race to finish, a course to complete, and a victor's crown to receive, 2 Timothy 4, 7. Listen to this true story. It was written on Focus on the Family in 1993, which is 24 years ago, but it still resonates today. One afternoon, author Patsy Claremont found herself in an airplane sitting next to a young man. She writes, I had already observed something about this young man when I was seated. He called me ma'am. At the time, I thought, either he thinks I'm ancient, or he's from the south where they still teach manners, or he's in the service. I decided the latter was the most likely, so I asked, were you in the service? Yes, ma'am, I am. What branch? The Marines. Hey, Marine, where are you coming from? Operation Desert Storm, ma'am. No kidding, Desert Storm? How long were you there? A year and a half. I'm on my way home. My family will be at the airport. I then commented that he must have thought about returning to his family and home many, many times while he was in the Middle East. Oh, no, ma'am, he replied. We were taught, listen carefully, beloved. We were taught never to think of what might never be, but to fully be available right where you were. That's what Marines were taught. I'm going to repeat it. Never to think of what might never be, but to fully be available right where you were. A.W. Tozer says that people who are crucified with Christ have three marks. One, they are facing only one direction. Two, they can never turn back. And three, they no longer have any plans of their own. Here, the story is told in Luke 24. It is Easter, and there is no joy. Two disciples are on the road to Emmaus, a little village about seven miles from Jerusalem. One disciple is named Cleopas. We do not know the name of the other. And as they walk along the dusty road, they leave Jerusalem far behind. You see, they were followers of a man called Jesus, the rabbi from Nazareth the teacher and miracle worker who claimed to have been sent by God. And for a long time, they had followed him as much as anyone could and as much as they could truly believe. And then came that terrible event on Friday. Jesus had been crucified. After his death, he was buried in a tomb. Although they had heard the rumors that the tomb had been found empty early that morning, they still could not and would not and did not believe any wild stories about a resurrection. If there was one thing that these disciples knew, they knew that the Romans knew what to do and how to do it and how to kill people. They knew that the Romans were very good at killing them. They could make it fast or they could make it short. They could make it easy or horrific, public or private relatively painless or excruciating, painful. Crucifixion was the most terrible way to kill in that day. No man wanted to be crucified. And only the worst of the worst suffered in that way. How had it come to this, they ask? If he truly was the son of God, how could this have happened? How many years 
Beloved, how many times over the years I have cried these words to the Lord. Lord, what's all this about? Lord, how could this have happened? Lord, I don't understand. Is there anyone here? Is there anyone can relate to what I'm saying to you this morning? Anyone? Amen? But I always get the same answer. He always tells me the same thing. I told you I will never leave you. I'll always be there beside you. And this is what these disciples found out. Their question, beloved, is our question. Only slightly rephrased. Where is Jesus when we need him? Where did he go? Why did he leave us? But if you really study this out, and it was funny because last night I was talking to the Lord about this story, and I realized something as I was reading it. I realized that Jesus had a sense of humor. I believe that he and the Father planned this. He could just have appeared to his disciples. Why walk along with these two and, and you know, keep them going? Because he was listening to all they were saying. And I believe with everything in me, after just talking to the Lord last night, I could feel it in my spirit. I could see Jesus standing there as they were telling him all these things, thinking they were talking to a stranger. And he's just kind of smiling like, mm-hmm, 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 mm-hmm. I can feel it. And, I, you know, if, if you really study this out, they walked and they talked. And I'm sure that they were reminiscing. They must have talked about the time of the man on the pallet that was lowered into the, through the roof. And I could just see Jesus, mm-hmm, under his breath, mm-hmm. I remember that day. Surely they talked about the time when Jesus took the five barley loaves and two fish and fed 5,000 men. And Jesus, mm-hmm. But you forgot something. There was all those baskets left over. And then they probably wondered how Jesus could raise Lazarus and be killed himself a week later. And Jesus is smiling. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yes, I sure did raise Lazarus. Yes, and you should have heard me shout, Lazarus, come forth. But he never let on who he was. You see, anyone who has lost a loved one, always tries to make sense out of the tragedy. Only those who have seen a dream crushed and the death of a great hope can enter fully into this story. Well, this little earpiece does not want So, hallelujah. <laughs> Give Jesus a big, big praise. So if you have ever walked in a way, away from a funeral, and you've been so deeply hurt that you could not speak, if you've loved and been deeply hurt, tried and failed, believed and then been disappointed, you know what it was like for these two disciples. See, there's an easy way to outline this story. Two men, three men, two men. Everything we need to know, beloved, is in those three phases. Down the road, two men walked. Deep in their sorrow and despair, suddenly a stranger joins them and walks with them. And when he leaves them, they are changed forever. How many of you know when you come to know Jesus, you too are changed forever? Amen. First their hearts are burdened, then their hearts are burning, then their hearts are bursting. Such is the power of the risen Christ. Here is an Easter message of hope 
for all who are confused and uncertain. It is also a message for those, and they're in this room today, and they're listening to me by YouTube today, that feel abandoned by the Lord. Because he rose from the dead, Jesus is always with us. You may be saying in your heart today, but pastor, I don't feel him. You're not always going to feel him, but that doesn't mean he's not there. And he said he'll wipe the, tre the tears from your eyes. And he said he will comfort those that mourn. And it may not be just the death of a loved one. You may have lost a job. You may have lost, you may be struggling with your health. You may have financial difficulties. You may have a, a family member that's gone away from, from the Lord. There's all kinds of grief in this world. But Jesus says, through it all, I'll be there. That's why we sing the song. Through it all, through it all, I've learned to trust in Jesus. It doesn't happen overnight. But I've learned to trust in Jesus. I've learned to trust in God. So it's a message to those who feel this way. Jesus is always with us. Wherever and at all times, in every situation. That's why I titled my message today, I Will Never Leave You. But for the most part, just like these disciples, we cannot recognize him. Verse 16 says, their eyes were kept from recognizing him. Why didn't they know it was Jesus? I know you've asked this question. After all, they were his disciples. There are many answers given to that question. Some say they didn't expect him and they didn't recognize him. Others say that it happened at sunset. This is a good one. It happened at sunset, so they were confused by the fading light. Ah. But the text gives us a different time. It was a supernatural veiling of their eyesight. That, and they, that they did see a man, but they did not know it was their Lord and their master. Every part of this story, beloved, is true to human nature as we know it. And here we, we see again a touch of humor. That Jesus is with them. They think he's dead. And they, they, they walked with the stranger. They said... He used to do this. And Jesus is saying, I still do. And you should have been there. I'm here right now. He could walk on water. Yeah, that was quite a feat, wasn't it? He was so kind. Oh, really? Weren't you there the day that I threw out the money changers from the temple? We never met anybody like him. And finally... I can't believe he's gone. How, how tempting it must have been for Jesus to say, guess what, guys? I'm here right now. But he held his tongue. On they walk. Talk, talk, talking. The stranger listening intently. Finally, he breaks in and he asks. <laughs> I love this. What are you talking about? The question, of course, perplexed the two men because everyone in Jerusalem knew about the crucifixion of Jesus. Are you the only one, they say? Are you the only one who hasn't heard? And so they tell the story to this inquisitive stranger. Their words are a combination of love, grief, pride, sorrow, belief, and doubt. And so they continue. Now, I have to remind you, Jesus is listening to everything they're saying, has still never said a thing to them about who he is. He was such a good man. And on they go on. He healed the sick. He raised the dead. We know he was a prophet. He ran into trouble with the chief priests. I believe at that point, Jesus said, that's the understatement of the day. You telling me you only think I ran into trouble with him? <laughs> We heard he was betrayed. They beat him. He couldn't stand. They put a crown of thorns in his head. And then they laughed at him. And I think, I believe the, the biggest temptation the Lord may have had would have been at that point when they said they laughed at him. I believe Jesus, with everything in him, may have wanted to say, guess who had the last laugh? Me. And I'm laughing right now with you on the road to Emmaus. I'm laughing with you because I know who I am, 
what I have done for you. Everything they said, beloved, was in the past tense, which is how we normally speak of the dead. They still loved him and still believed in him, and as best they could, they clung to every cherished memory. Crucifixion could not make them stop loving him, but they could not square the events of the past 48 hours with their faith that he was indeed the Son of God. They were disappointed. Many of us have been disappointed. Many of us have been there. They felt their faith slipping away with every step of the road to Emmaus. They had heard the rumors of the empty tomb. But what did that mean? No one had seen Jesus yet, or so they assumed. There comes a time in life, beloved, when you have to face the facts. This is what they're thinking. And deal with reality. So ends the sad tale of Jesus, a story that had such a promising beginning. They believed in Jesus, and he let them down. The third day was almost gone. Jesus was no pair to be found. Bring down the curtain. It's all over. Except for this scripture, I will never leave you. This is what Good Friday looks like, beloved, without Easter. Without the resurrection, the cross is nothing. Nothing but a tragedy, a story without a morale, a drama that ends before the final act. There are three points that I'd like to mention this morning to you. Number one, we see that many times we don't recognize Jesus. He comes in all kinds of forms. He speaks to you through his word. He speaks through, through you from a, a kind word that somebody would give you about the Bible. He speaks to you through kind acts. He speaks to you when you're least expecting to hear from him. Number two, we all are slow to believe. Every one of us, myself included, I say many times to the Lord, Lord, I believe. Help me, that help thou my unbelief. Do you follow what I'm saying? When you're facing a huge, huge step of faith. The Holy Spirit spoke this to me a few nights ago when I was praying for somebody. And I was praying, I said, Lord, they have a huge step of faith ahead of them. And the Lord spoke back to me and said, my footprints are bigger than their steps. Get them into my footprints. My footprints go ahead of them. He'll never leave us. And the third point, sometimes he seems to leave us. But again, I repeat, he never will. Verses 28 through 32 paint a touching picture of Jesus eating supper with Cleopas and the other disciple. Now remember, they still don't know who he is. They think they've stumbled upon a stranger who knows everything there is to know about the Bible. They have no idea that it is the Lord. So many times, beloved, we seek the spectacular and the supernatural is right in front of our faces. And so we see that one, Jesus comes in when he is invited. Two, he eats with them. Three, he vanishes as soon as he is recognized. Note this carefully. Jesus disappears, but not until his disciples recognize him. He doesn't leave until they recognize him. When you, when you recognize him, beloved, when you and I were born again, when we received the Lord, when we know Jesus is alive, everything changes. These disciples ran back to Jerusalem when they realized that Jesus was alive. You and I are told by the Lord to go to Jerusalem, Judea, and into the uttermost parts of the earth. You run. You will tell everything that you have heard. In Jesus' name. The Good Friday, I was really on this about my own testimony and how I witnessed for Christ in those early days and still do. I was in a place of business yesterday. It just absolutely shocked me because this little lady didn't want me to leave. And she kept saying to me, please don't go. Can I not give you something else? And I, I, I've got to go. No, I want you to keep talking. I want to hear you talking. And another couple standing to the left of me said, yeah, please, let's hear you talk. I love that accent. love that voice. And I'm saying, okay, Lord, I got it. So I went into my purse, got my track out, and told them, if you really love it that much, you can hear it every Sunday morning at 10 o'clock. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> a 
And it was a grocery store, and this little lady, God bless her, and she, she said, I only wanted some ham. That's all I wanted, <laughs> a pound of ham. And she said, and I'm trying to walk away, don't you need any cheese? No. Well, can I not get you some turkey? No. What about down here? I said, no, I don't want anything. So it'll be something when next week comes, because she said she's coming. So we'll see. But Jerusalem, Judea, the uttermost parts of the earth, when you know he is alive, you want everybody else to know he is alive. <laughs> Hallelujah. And God is my witness. I had no intentions of witnessing to any of these people. But I know when God puts me in that position, I better listen. So that's why the two disciples couldn't wait to get back to Jerusalem. Even though it was late in the evening, they had to go back and tell others what they had seen and what they had heard. And again, I repeat it. Once you encounter Christ, nothing will ever be the same again. If Jesus is alive, there's no time to waste. If Jesus is alive, everything we believe is true. If Jesus is alive, then death has been defeated. If Jesus is alive, then heaven is more than a dream. If Jesus is alive, then our sins are really forgiven. If Jesus is alive, then all his promises are true. If Jesus is alive, we can never truly be alone again. Never alone again. Where is Jesus, I ask, when we need him most? He is with us and he is within us because he has risen from the dead and he said, I will never leave you. Never. So the simple truth of this message is a picture of life after the resurrection. There are two men alone in their despair. They come and, and Jesus comes and gives them hope. Jesus leaves, but the men are changed forever. He's been gone, you might say, for over 2,000 years, Pastor. Yes, that's true, but it's not quite true. He is gone in terms of his physical presence on the earth, but he's more with us now than when he was when he was here. How do we know this is true? Because of the last verse of Scripture in Matthew's Gospel, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. He is with us always. Even though we do not recognize him, even though we can't find him, even though we are slow to believe, even though he seems to leave us, all of this is true because Christ has risen from the dead. He has gone from our sight that we, he may be seen by our faith. I want to repeat that. I don't think you got it. He has gone from our sight that we may be, he may be seen by our faith. It's through faith. And so where are we now? We all live somewhere between Good Friday and Easter Sunday. We are all on that long Amaze road. We're all on that journey together. There are times when we may feel alone and overwhelmed and doubt creeps in and our hearts give way. And we feel that we can't go on. Then Jesus comes to us. And he says, you're not alone. You've never been alone. Even when you thought you were alone, I was with you every step of the way. So as I began this message, and I'm ready to close up now, we still make that long walk from the grave. We still weep, and we remember, and we wonder why. But everything has changed now. Listen carefully, beloved, because this is the message to the church today. It may be Saturday for many of us, but thank God, Easter has already dawned across this universe. A bright light shines from the garden tomb. The light slowly chases the darkness away until one day the darkness will be gone forever. And we will behold him. We will see Jesus and all that we've gone through in this earth will be nothing. And we will say to those whom we love, we'll see you in the morning. Child of God, behold the risen Christ. You will never be 
alone again. We are Easter people marching from Good Friday through Holy Saturday on the way to Easter Sunday. We may not quite be there, but we're moving in the right direction. For many of us, it's Saturday in our lives, but Sunday's coming. Hallelujah. And every Easter we celebrate this triple truth of this holy day. The tomb is empty. Jesus is alive. We are not alone. He is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. He's risen. I'm closing with this true story. On a bitter cold Virginia night, an old man waited on a path near the river. He was hoping somebody on a horse would come by and carry him across. His beard was glazed with frost and his body was numb before he finally heard crosses, uh, rather horses coming. Anxiously, he waited and watched as several horsemen passed without even noticing them. Finally, when only one rider remained, the old man caught his eye and asked, Sir, would you mind giving me a ride to the other side? Graciously, the rider helped him on his horse and sensing that he was half frozen, decided to take him all the way home, which was several miles out of his way. And as they rode, the horseman asked, why didn't you ask one of the others to help you? I was the last one. What if I had refused? And the old man said, son, I've lived a long while, and I know pre people pretty well. When I looked into their eyes, I saw no concern at all for me. So I knew it was useless to ask. But when I looked into your eyes, I saw kindness and compassion. At the door of the old man's house, the rider stopped, looked up, and silently prayed, God, may I never get so busy with my own affairs that I fail to respond to the needs of others. Listen, and with that, President Thomas Jefferson turned and directed his horse back towards the White House. And we wonder why we live in a, in a country called the greatest country in the world. Because of that kind of seed that was sown. Amen. So you see, Jesus did all of this, beloved, for you and I to receive God's kindness, compassion, and unconditional love. And if that wasn't enough, he said, I will never leave you. Glory to God. Give him a big praise. Keisha, I'd like you to come at this time, if you would. And then after you sing, I'm going to pray for people. Where are you, Keisha? God bless you. Thank you. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Just calling for the praise team, if you would. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Glory to God. 